Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with an exam review for the topic of rigid body kinematics, which is rigid body motion. So there's not going to be any forces, just all positions, velocities, and accelerations, both linear and angular. So we're going to cover the topics of pure translation, of fixed axis rotation, of general plane motion. Now we're going to skip absolute motion as it basically uses a different construct than the additive motion that we use in all the other topics. And so in my classes, I don't cover it. So therefore this video, it won't be covered. So to start with the big picture, the overall chapter 16, what are we talking about here? First of all, rigid bodies, they don't flex, they don't bend. They are going to basically maintain a equal distance between points on that body, no matter how the body moves. Okay, so a rigid body doesn't flex, doesn't bend, doesn't stretch. So points on the body are going to be an equal distance apart, no matter how it moves through space, translation, rotation, or general plane motion. Angular velocity is going to be constant for a body at an instant. Okay, so a single body is going to have an angular velocity. Also, a single body is going to have one single angular acceleration. So angular acceleration and velocity do not vary by location. They vary with a body. Now, if you have multiple bodies in a system, then each one of those will likely have its own angular velocity and angular acceleration. As we take a look at position vectors, position vectors, we use the letter R, and we tend to use the notation this A slash B. Basically, this means of A relative to B, meaning that our position vector goes to A from B. So you can also think of it being um, to slash from, as we write that slash notation. And just noting that if we want the opposite direction of this relative position vector, we could have put a negative outside out front of it. And all that's going to do is it's going to switch. Instead of going to A from B, it's going to go from A to B. Right? It's just going to flip it around and go in the opposite direction. These three equations right here, cross products of omega crossing into R equal to linear velocity, a cross product of angular acceleration alpha crossed with R gives us a tangential acceleration. And then our omega squared, this is a scalar omega value squared in the negative r direction, gives us our normal acceleration. These are the fundamental basis of almost all computations in this entire chapter. Now, the things that vary in these equations is that we can actually use these r vectors either as absolute or or relative position vectors. If they are relative, then the linear values, linear velocity, and then the linear acceleration that come out of it will also be relative. If they are absolute, then you're going to have absolute linear values for the velocity and acceleration. Okay, So they're flexible equations that whatever we feed them, we get the related term out the other side. And the other thing related to what we can feed them we typically compute all of these R vectors in XY components. And if we compute those in XY components, it's going to force all of the other linear vectors in that equation to also be in XY components. And the reason this is really valuable is that tangent normal components vary by location, even location on a single body. And so if you try to bring those together into one single equation, you're gonna have disagreement between tangent and normal, but you'll never have disagreement between XY because XY is our Cartesian coordinate system. It never changes in direction once we pick what that is. And the last point to make here is that the motion of a body in general plane motion can essentially be described by finding the absolute motion of one part and adding the relative motion of another part. And we get into this essentially in section 16.5 through 16.8. It's kind of the fundamental basis of all the general plane motion we cover in this chapter. So that's the big picture. Zooming in now to translation. Now translation turns out to be quite simple because you already know everything you needed to know coming out of particle translation, particle kinematics. And the reason for that is that all points on a body in translation have exactly the same linear velocity 
and linear acceleration. Now the acceleration both tangent and normal. So it doesn't matter if we have a box that is in translation. Let's say that the centroid is translating up that direction. So that would be its velocity. We could draw the velocity of every other single point on this body is going in the exact same direction with the exact same magnitude. Okay, so it's purely translating up to the right. Therefore, it has no angular velocity. It also does not have an angular acceleration. Okay, so that's all we're, I'm really going to say about those. Um, those of you that were in my class know that we really didn't solve any problems on this topic because it would essentially be a review of the, the previous particle topic, which we already covered and already had exams on. Okay, so moving forward, we got into fixed axes rotation. Now, let me just highlight before we get to them, here's those three fundamental equations that we said that everything is based upon, and they're introduced here in section 16.3. So a fixed axis, by definition, is a pin with a linear velocity of zero and a linear acceleration of zero. Therefore, if you're looking for the linear values of velocity and acceleration of a pin, you're going to get zeros across the board. Now, we're going to treat that pin as basically part of the body that's rotating around it. And so even if we're using the omega or alpha of that pin location, we're going to use the omega or alpha of the body itself. Now, all our vectors in fixed axis rotation go from the fixed axis to the point of interest. Uh, let me just draw a little diagram here. And so if we have a pin located here in the lower left of a rectangular body, and we're interested to know what's going on over here, call this point A, we're going to draw a position vector here from our pin up to A. If I call this down here point O, I can call that R of A relative to O. All right, so a position vector from the pin to other points on the body. And then if we add into this an omega, let's say that our angular velocity omega, which is the time rate of change of angular position, what we're going to find is that if we cross that omega, and this omega is positive from the right-hand rule, we end up with a positive as we wrap our fingers around toward the arrow tips and our thumb comes out of the screen or out of the board or out of your paper, that's positive from the right-hand rule. And if we cross that into the R vector, and you can see my other videos on cross products if you're still struggling with those, we end up with a linear velocity coming horizontally to the left. And we know it's horizontal because we knew that the R vector was vertical, and those have to be perpendicular coming out of the cross product. The tangential acceleration is based upon alpha. Let's go ahead and add an alpha to this problem. Let's assume that our alpha is going in the opposite direction as our omega. Therefore, omega is slowing down. We could think here that this is going to be a negative alpha from the right-hand rule. Looking at our equations, we're going to cross that alpha, negative, into my position vector. We're going to end up with a tangential acceleration, a sub t, horizontal to the right. And then the last acceleration component we can have is normal. Now, the normal is going to be in the negative r direction. That's why these r vectors are so important to draw. Coming back down along r, a sub n. And all we're going to do there is we're going to we're going to square this omega right here, the value of that omega. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative because it's going to be a scalar squared value. And then multiply times the negative components of the r vector. That's essentially what that equation is saying. So no cross product, just a scalar times the vector components. Now, if you're interested in relating just the angular terms, right, keep in mind these equations above related linear to angular, but say you have a problem, you just need to relate the angular positions, the velocities, and accelerations. We have this set of equations that is very parallel to the same equations we had relating linear position to linear velocity to linear acceleration. Okay, so if these equations look somewhat familiar and you're like, oh, there's, everywhere there's a theta, I've seen S's there, and everywhere there's an omega, I've seen a V, and everywhere there's an alpha, I've seen an A, you're totally right. Uh, but we can essentially relate this information for bodies in fixed axis rotation across their angular position, velocity, and acceleration. We do have a few integrals here. These integrals show up if we have um, variable acceleration. Essentially, if the omega or alpha vary with time, then we need to integrate over those to figure out how the related terms relate. Now, 
here's a kind of a repeat of those three equations that we said are the fundamental equations across all of chapter 16. Noting that there's also a scalar version of those. Now, the reason the scalar version works really quite well is because, revisiting our diagram up here, we know that this is pretty much all the time perpendicular. It's, it's specifically perpendicular in every single fixed axis rotation problem. So if you know that V is already perpendicular to R, you can simply find that V is equal to omega times R, and then you can get the direction if you wanted to by your observation of the geometry of the problem. If we have a case of two gears with no slip wheels about their centers, so just highlighting here, both of these wheels need to rotate about their middles, and they're contacting right here at this point and not slipping at that point, it turns out they're going to have exactly the same linear velocity v. They're also going to have exactly the same acceleration. If I assume that my alpha is opposite my omega, I could say that my a sub t is equal and opposite. Now, a sub n is going to be opposite direction, pointing back toward each center of curvature with the magnitude varying according to the radiuses. Okay, so it's not going to be exactly the same. It turns out it's been the same line of action. If you have the same radius wheels to the same radius wheels, then the value, the magnitude of a sub n would be equal, but its direction would still be opposite. All right, so that covers for us fixed axes rotations. Really important to build upon that section, like I said, especially understanding these three equations for linear velocity, linear tangential acceleration, and linear normal acceleration. So building upon that, we now get into essentially multi-body systems. And in multi-body systems, particularly whether we have additive motion or whether we have four-bar linkages, we end up with bodies that are in general plane motion. Now, general plane motion is saying that things are translating plus rotating. Okay, so just a reminder there, this is saying translating plus rotating. All right, so in that kind of situation, we have our standard equation. Now, I talk about a standard equation. This equation was actually introduced for particles. If you had two particles that were moving, we found that you could, you could relate them with two absolute terms, right? This is an absolute term, this is an absolute term, and this is a relative term between the two. Now, as we get into rigid bodies, we're going to have make sure that both A and B are on the same body. Okay, so it's not on two separate bodies, but simply on one single rigid body, and we have a fixed distance between those. So because we have a fixed distance between those two bodies, it turns out that this relative term can actually be expressed with a cross product. So we could say that VB is, is equal to VA plus my omega of AB, which is a vector, and we're going to cross that into R of B relative to A. So a couple things to pick up here. One of those is that my subscripts on my R vector is exactly the same of my subscripts on my velocity vector, and that is always true. And like I said, the reason we end up with this fairly simple cross product is the distance R B relative to A. The distance doesn't change, but the direction of that position vector does change, and so we need to incorporate the relative in between the two. So I mentioned these two different kinds of um, multi-body constraint systems that we cover in dynamics, one of those being four-bar linkages. Now, four-bar linkages, as you look at them, they can actually have as few as two bars, but there's some nuances in that everywhere you get sliding, you pick up a bar, and every um, pair of fixed points that basically doesn't change in distance between those points that things are anchored to, like fixed axis rotation pins, that also equates a bar. And so as you're adding up your bars, you can actually get to four bars with only two physical bars. And I'll talk a little bit about those as we move forward. Now, the other kind of motion we have is what I call additive motion. And you're essentially adding the motion of one body onto the motion of another. Now, if you're looking for more um, insight on these two different systems, there's actually a video posted to the YouTube channel that focuses specifically on the differences between these as it relates to this exact topic here, 16.5, which is general plane motion or this relative velocity topic. Now, if you have additive motion, 
additive motion alone, you'll have to deal with adding together your angular velocities. Essentially what we want for angular velocities, it doesn't matter if we're doing four bar linkages or additive motion, we always want absolute angular velocities. Okay, and so if you're given a relative angular velocity of the outer body rotating around the inner, you're just going to need to add that to the body that it is it is touching. And so if I draw a quick little diagram of this, so here if this is point A and here's a bar coming out of A and then another pin. Now this pin here at B only connects body AB to BC. And so we're talking about here is if we have an omega of AB and then a secondary omega here, omega of BC relative to AB, which is how quickly this outer body is rotating around pin B. In this case, we actually want to add the two omegas together. These both turn out to be negative from the right-hand rule, and so we'll have an even larger um, absolute omega of this outer body, the omega of BC. That's the equation I was referring to. Now, as you look at the motion of pins connecting a body in constrained motion, realize that the velocities and accelerations, both the linear velocity and linear acceleration of the pin is basically being translated through that pin. We could actually look at the same diagram right here and let's just focus on say the motion here of B, right? Which is our pin connecting these two bodies. Now B happens to be in fixed axis rotation around A, but what we're saying here is that once we find the linear V and linear acceleration of B coming off of body AB, then we're gonna have the exact same value on body BC. Okay, so at these connections, we can say that pins transfer linear velocity and linear acceleration. Now, noting that the bodies are gonna have different values of angular velocity and angular acceleration. So this is only true for transferring the linear terms, which is highlighted here, the linear velocity and acceleration. And then I already covered here that this relative velocity, I covered it right up here, that essentially because the distance between B and A don't change, we can express that uh, velocity as a relative rotational velocity um, around point A. All right, so here are a couple of examples drawn up for you and kind of highlighting here both a four bar linkage as well as an additive motion system. So hopefully this expresses a little bit more completely um, the mentality thinking through these different topics. Make sure that you can draw all of these vectors in these diagrams. You should be able to draw the angular vectors, the position vectors that connect things together, and also the linear velocity and linear acceleration vectors. Now these two diagrams focus on velocity, make sure that you could do the acceleration ones as well. The most challenging ones to draw, first of all, would be this one, right? This is this relative linear velocity of R from the perspective of Q. The key thing that you want to draw before trying to draw that velocity vector, two things. One of those is this position vector. And then secondly, the direction of this angular velocity. In this case, we use this ICZV to help us locate that angular velocity because we know that the ICZV is gonna be treated like a point on body QR. And so therefore, if you know that your VQ is going up to the right, then your angular velocity must be positive from the right-hand rule in order to match up with this linear velocity of VQ going up to the right, right? The body be swinging around in this direction here counterclockwise. Okay, so once you have your R, once you have your omega, just cross the two vectors, right? Isn't that simply what this is equal to here? So let me just put this in yellow. We're going to cross our omega of QR into this position vector. So make sure you can do that cross product. Once again, positive from the right-hand rule, crossing that into that R vector gives us this relative vector up to the right. Noting that both VQ and VR in this case are both in fixed axis rotation around P and S respectively. As we look at the lower system here, the additive motion system, 
usually the goal in this case is to figure out the velocity of this outermost point. It's most convenient to put that outermost point on the left side of the equal sign. It turns out that for the four bar linkage, you could take your pick. You could either compute this of Q relative to R or of R relative to Q. It's no harder or easier either way. You just basically end up flipping this R vector. Now, if you looked at the velocity of Q relative to R, let's just sketch that out, still perpendicular to that R vector. It's still going to be based upon this omega but the r vector is coming down this direction so positive omega cross r gives us the velocity of q relative to r so also noting that whatever point the velocity comes out of is going to be the first term above the slash in the relative velocity expression all right back down to additive so for additive motion it turns out that we cannot draw this vr vector until we do all this stuff okay in a four bar linkage you can actually predictively know what direction the absolute and relative terms are going to be going before you compute anything it's actually based upon the fundamental geometry but in additive motion we need to first figure out what direction vq is going then figure out how r is moving around q relative to it add those two things together and then it's going to equal our vr Okay, so that's that general idea there. This also expresses how we can use the um, relative angular velocity and add that to our absolute to come up with the other absolute, a similar equation that I expressed above. So building on this topic, a parallel approach, is the idea of instantaneous centers of zero velocity. You can also express this as instantaneous centers of zero rotation. This is, comes out of section 16.6 of the Hibbler textbook. So a couple of key things about an ICZV. An ICZV of a fixed axis body is the fixed axis. That's pretty easy. An ICZV of a body in pure translation turns out to be undefined. Now, the reason it's undefined is that as we get into the rules, you'll see below here that we're going to have these, these extension lines perpendicular to velocities. If all the velocities are already parallel, these extension lines will never cross, and we get an undefined ICZV. And then the place where we find the most value in ICZVs is for bodies in general plane motion. And they can either be located on or off the body. And we're going to use one of three rules in this table below. Since I already mentioned the table, let's go ahead and take a look at it. So here's the three rules. One of those is if we have non-slip contact points with non-moving bodies. Okay, so we're talking about here the non-moving bodies are going to be this fixed axis pin, are going to be the ground, and is going to be this cable. Okay, so those three bodies are not moving. Our body that we're trying to analyze is moving basically in contact with those and not slipping. Therefore, the linear velocity of the contact point is zero, both on the non-moving body and also on the moving body, right? But only at that location. Another rule that we can use, if we have parallel velocities and we have a perpendicular connecting line, let me map this out, okay? So velocity is parallel, but they have to be along the same line, um, excuse me, they have to be perpendicular to the same line, okay? So A and B fundamentally have to have a line between them and then your velocities have to be perpendicular to that line. And what we can do here is we can do what we call a tip to tip and tail to tail. So as we think about the tip to tip, it's basically running from velocity arrow tip to velocity arrow tip and the tail to tail. And what we're going to find is those two points intersect at some point. And wherever they intersect is going to be the ICZV. That can be, once again, on the body or off the body, just depending on the type of motion. The last rule that we use for non-parallel velocities. Now, this is the least restrictive rule because there's nothing... Um, no, there's no standard of how these points are located, if they're perpendicular to something, anything else, just two non-parallel velocities. We extend lines that are perpendicular to both of them. Okay, so not a line, this, it's not the line of action of the velocity, it's perpendicular to the line of action of that velocity. And so we extend those back and we find out for this problem that the ICZV is here uh, to the lower left. You'll find out for bodies in fixed axis rotation, Okay, so this OA is in fixed axis rotation. Now, its ICZV, of course, is going to be 0.0. But if we look at the 
the extension line on an arm and fixed axis rotation, it's always the arm itself, right? Isn't the velocity of any point, even if I drew a velocity, say, down here, along that arm is perpendicular to the arm. So perpendicular to perpendicular means it's going to be along the arm itself. That's just kind of a hint there that if you have a fixed axis rotation arm, that the extension line will just be going up or down that arm. And so it really is going to depend on the extension line coming from the other body or the other point, in this case, point B, where those are going to intersect. All right, back to our key points. We're going to treat all ICZVs like they are a point of fixed axis rotation. Turns out we're going to treat them with the same omega, the same alpha as the body, but it's just going to be for one instant, one moment in time. And once you find the ICZV, we need to find out where it is spatially. So essentially by using ICZVs, we're going to trade often some vector algebra for some geometry. And so we need to work through some of that geometry. It's like, where is this point? I need the distances from this point to my points of linear velocity. And we use those points of linear velocity in this equation here where we say, well, I'm going to focus more on my scalar relationships and my linear relationships because I know that my r is perpendicular to the v. And so I can say v is equal to omega times r, and then also omega is equal to v divided by the length of r. I think that the process of actually mapping the linear and angular velocities using ICZVs on a four bar linkage is magical. It works really, really well to help you think about how that system is moving. Once you understand the velocities, then typically you can understand the acceleration even better. So uh, it's a really key thing to learn how to know, learn how to do. And it's something that you may see on exams. You've likely already seen it on quizzes if you have me for an instructor, um, but it's a, it's a key point to this whole chapter. All right, so continuing to build on this idea of relative motion, we got into section 16.7. Now, this uses fundamentally the same equation, right, a relative motion equation, except for now we're dealing with both tangent and normal of every single one of these terms. And so if we're looking at tangent and normal, we can actually expand out this equation into a much larger form, saying that, hey, we've got both tangents and normals. Now realize that all of these absolute tangents and normals for points A and B, those also might come from cross products. Once again, these are going to be built upon those fundamental equations v vector is equal to omega vector cross r vector. Uh, the tangential a sub t is going to equal, I'm saying these in this right amount, v is equal to omega cross r. a sub t is equal to alpha cross r. And then a sub n is equal to omega squared in the negative r. Okay, so these are going to be your fundamental equations. It doesn't matter if I've if I've listed them all out here. The reason I didn't list these out is they can come from different places depending on the motion of the system. Some of these go to zero. Some of them will come from these equations. I guess that's honestly kind of the two two things that'll typically happen, either zero or coming from these equations. So once again, there's two kinds of two-dimensional motion. Now, this is a very parallel structure to talking about velocity. The main difference here is that we're not talking about omegas anymore. We're talking about alphas. But it turns out that you can actually add together your alphas to come up with your absolute angular acceleration of that outer body in the same structure that we did for velocities. Now, the, one of the things about angular acceleration and linear acceleration, all this relative acceleration that's challenging, is that we cannot compute the acceleration terms until we have all of our omegas. Now, the reason these omegas are so key is actually linked right back into this equation right here is this omega squared. And so if we're focused here on accelerations, while for tangential acceleration, it's going to be based upon your alphas, your normal acceleration is based upon omega. Okay, so you need your omegas, and typically it helps to also have your r vectors coming out of your velocity computations in order to move into acceleration. Now, one other challenge with acceleration is there's no such thing as a instantaneous center of zero acceleration, right? ICZVs are magic for velocity, but they don't directly work for acceleration. You can still use them for the velocity parts of acceleration problems, and I would advise that you do because ICZVs are faster than doing your vector algebra. 
but you cannot apply them directly saying, hey, here's a point of zero acceleration. It turns out that most ICZVs, and I'm basically just stating this line that's right here, those that are not fixed axes do have a normal acceleration. So even if they're A sub T, their tangential acceleration is zero, their normal likely is not zero. So we have to deal with that. Now, once again, pins between moving bodies are going to transfer the linear acceleration between bodies, just like they transfer the linear velocity. And so that's not really any different between uh, velocity and acceleration, just noting that they also transfer the normal. Uh, I know that the normal acceleration is like the, the acceleration that everyone loves to forget about. Um, tangential seems to be the star of the show, the ones that students remember best. But consider that every single point likely has a normal acceleration until you prove that it doesn't. Now, looking at this relative acceleration, I'll point this out as we get down here. Actually, let's go ahead and just kind of scroll up. That we're left with those two points and then our overall, our overall equation. So I've mapped out again this acceleration, all these different terms, both absolute and also relative based upon a four bar linkage and also based upon an additive motion system. Now noting I could have expanded this equation even further if I'd wanted to. Let me just go ahead and take a look at this one specifically. That like my acceleration of A tangential is fundamentally equal to my alpha of OA as a vector crossed with my R of A relative to O. Okay, that's the equation for acceleration of A sub T. Acceleration of A sub N, we could say, is equal to my omega of OA squared in the negative R of A relative to O. Okay, so that'd be the equation for AAN. So once again, these can come from different places, uh, be based upon different alphas and omegas and R vectors. Uh, so really this, this most general form is just kind of a placeholder. If you actually go to compute these, you need to get down to those specific forms as well. Now you should also not only be able to draw the velocity vectors for either a four bar linkage or additive motion, but additionally draw the acceleration vectors. The two most challenging ones, we'll, we'll zoom in and look at both of them here. Um, that we're dealing with are the relative tangent and relative normal. Okay, so here is my relative tangent. That relative tangent is based upon this alpha, right, negative from the right hand rule, and also on, I'll highlight this one in blue coming down this direction, this r vector, right? This is the r of a relative to b, this vector right here. And so if we cross a negative alpha into that r vector, we're going to end up with a vector which is going up to the right. Now I know I drew this kind of down over to the left, but noting that arrowhead is pointing up to the right just in the same direction, my velocity of a relative to b. Now the relative normal is going to oppose this blue r vector. Right? We know this is going to be omega squared, and the omega we're talking about here is omega of a b in the negative r of a relative to b and that equation is all written right here as well so here is the tangent that we talked about and here is that normal now noting as we work this problem that we are still relating two points that are on the same body okay a and b are still on the same body a, we can figure out with fixed axis rotation. Body AB is in general plane motion. Fundamentally, we're finding the velocity, excuse me, the acceleration of A, and we're adding to it the acceleration of, of B relative to A to therefore find our absolute acceleration of B. Now, the reason on this problem that our normal, acceleration of B normal equals zero is we have a straight path. Uh, and anytime you have a straight path, we don't need a normal acceleration because normal accelerations, their fundamental job is to keep things in a curved path. And so um, linear paths don't need normal accelerations. All right, so moving on now to the additive motion system, fairly similar, similar overall, just noting that we need to deal with adding together our alphas and our omegas because the two out here, this omega and this alpha need to be absolute, okay? They cannot be relative, in this case, 2.A. They must be absolute. So make sure to get them in that form if you need to.
All right, to the last section of this topic. Now, I think I think all of you would probably love it if we stopped at just relative acceleration. Bringing in slipping between rigid bodies, it also can be thought of as a rotating or a relative coordinate system, is not the easiest step, but is a necessary one because we start to talk about the Coriolis acceleration. Now, the Coriolis acceleration is due to a velocity moving across a rotating body, is the, is the fundamental idea. But we also have, in this context, either four bar linkages or additive motion. The two ways we can think about these slipping terms, right? So keep in mind, one of the, the key points here is we have slipping between rotating bodies. And so the two ways that we can essentially um, quantify that slipping, one of those is to put a marker point on the body with the slot or rod, essentially the body that is allowing the sliding. And then there's going to be a point on the other body immediately adjacent to that. We tended to use in our notes and our derivations the letter P for that marker point. Now, the other way you can think about these, if you want to, and this is how Hibbler approaches it, is that you anchor a moving axis system to point P. Okay, so you can think of P as fundamentally the origin of an axis system. Now, the axis system not only moves with P translationally, it also rotates with the body that P is attached to. Okay, so it's not simply a moving axis system. It's actually um, translating as well as rotating in many problems. So I think it's easiest to put the point that's adjacent to P on the left side of the equation. Okay, so what I'm talking about here is whatever point is slipping past P, I'm going to put it over here on the left side of the, either my velocity or my acceleration equation. You don't have to do that. You actually can write these equations with other points there on the left. Keep in mind that we always have to have our subscripts cancel, and this is where this um, tool becomes most important. Okay, so we look at our subscripts here, say of the velocity equation, we have our subscript on the left is B. On the right-hand side, we have A, and we take the product, we multiply these subscripts, they're gonna cancel out. So P relative to A, and then the last term here of B relative to P. And so canceling out A cancels with A, P cancels with P, and we're left with B is equal to B, which is exactly what we want. Okay, that validates that our equation will actually work. Once again, you can write other equations, say, that don't have the point adjacent to P on the left, but I just find consistency works pretty well for me in that context to go with that point always. All right, the other thing that we pick up, I mentioned the Coriolis acceleration. I think of the Coriolis as this bonus acceleration, right? Realizing that every single other term in this equation has a tangent, has a normal. And then all of a sudden, for the slipping term, we get a tangent, a normal, and a Coriolis. And so the equation for the Coriolis is the Coriolis acceleration is two times the omega of the body, which contains point P, crossed with the slipping velocity that we computed in our velocity version of the equation. So once again, as you get into this topic, you cannot compute the acceleration terms without knowing both the slipping velocity and then also our omegas of the moving bodies um, out of the velocity equation, okay? We, essentially what happens there is we don't have enough unknowns available in the acceleration to adopt those additional velocity unknowns. They need to be solved for ahead of time. And so these two diagrams, let me zoom in first on this one. We have a four bar linkage. Now, one thing you'll notice in the four bar linkages with slipping between the bodies is that we end up typically just having two bodies. And we think about the four bars, essentially one of the bars here is CD, another bar here is AB. We pick up another bar, which is basically the slipping between collar C and arm AB, and then the fourth bar connects A to D, if you're getting into the details of why is it a four bar linkage. But in these kind of problems, we luckily end up with one of the points having a zero velocity. Now, one of the ways you can think about the these problems, and let me actually show the equation associated with this one. I just realized here on the review sheet that I don't have the associated equation that links all of these together, but I will say that it is in the general form of, so the point adjacent to P is gonna be C, A, C, 
is equal to coming from the other body. Now keep in mind that AC sees in fixed axis rotation around point D. So my other equation is gonna to need to come from the other body coming this direction out of A. Okay, so this is going to be my acceleration of A plus my acceleration of P relative to A plus my acceleration of C relative to P. And that checks the boxes of my subscripts canceling. A goes by A, P goes away with P, I get C is equal to C. So there's my general equation. And then you can expand that out into the tangent, the normal, plus your bonus Coriolis coming out of the slipping acceleration term. Now again here, the most challenging terms show up over um, toward the right end of this equation. These are your relative terms. So the relative tangent and normal of P relative to A. Now one convenient thing in a four bar linkage out of section 16.8 is that because A has a zero acceleration because it's a fixed axis pin, it turns out that P, both the tangent and normal are actually absolute acceleration terms because point A isn't moving. So that's convenient. So the only ones we have left to kind of think through are gonna be the slipping terms. Now the slipping tangent is always going to be in the direction that the slipping is going, right? So it's either speeding up or slowing down, but along that line of action, which is gonna put the slipping normal being perpendicular. Now the slipping normal will only be non-zero in cases where you have a curved slipping path. Okay, so in this problem, we'd actually find that our acceleration of C relative to P normal would go to zero because we have a linear path in this case. Now for additive motion, um, I this is a really complex additive motion problem. Adding together our omegas, adding together our alphas, we have kind of a third rotating body here causing this relative motion between, in this case, A and R. And so we have all sorts of different terms. Very few of them go to zero. The only reason that a couple of them go to zero is we actually have an alpha that goes to zero. And then one omega is constant is the reason that those two end up going to zero. But we end up adding on essentially everything on the right side of the equation adds up to equal the acceleration of R. And that's a very common setup in an additive motion problem that we don't know what's going on over here with AR until we figure out all the stuff on the right-hand side and add it all together. All right, so that wraps up the last section, which is section 16.8, which looks at slipping between moving bodies and or you can think of it as rotating axis systems. I hope that this helps knit together the very complex and challenging chapter, which is rigid body kinematics or rigid body motion for dynamics. I think it's actually the hardest chapter that we cover in this class. And so I applaud you for all of your hard work. Thanks for cranking away on this and let me know if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.